Okay, everybody, uh, thank you very much for coming along. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about for the next 40 to 45 minutes is the Second World War, the state and the British Conservative Party between 1939 and 1951. And uh, this is for the Arts and Humanities Society, which uh, is our new name for the uh, LRAC. And I want to start by first of all describing a myth about Conservative Party policy in the 20th century. And it's one with which you're probably familiar. So at least until the 1990s, there was a kind of standard narrative about the Tory party's approach to the state. And it went something like this. The party apparently adopted a limited state, laissez-faire approach to social and economic issues in the interwar years. And that position, which was embodied in the national government, which um, certainly in its uh, iteration, its sort of its latter iteration, was was uh, dominated by the uh, Conservative Party, led to the party being seen as gratuitously neglectful in respect of unemployment and manufacturing de decline in the Depression years. But then the Second World War and Labour's landslide win in 1945 caused a major revision in Tory policy with the party embracing full employment, welfare state and indeed some of the apparatus of collectivism that had been created by Attlee's government. And so the Tories were able thereby to discard their nasty, in inverted commas, interwar image and embrace the consensus created by the war and by the Labour Party. And this new state-friendly conservatism was to last until the mid-1970s, when it was destroyed by the arrival of Margaret Thatcher and her neoliberal supporters. Now, that's the narrative, and it's a, you know, it's a fairly straightforward narrative. And it does have the advantage uh, of being coherent and easy to understand. And likewise, it contains some truth, but nonetheless, it is too simplistic. And one of the problems here that here is that until maybe about 20 years ago, the Tory party had pretty much been allowed to write its own history. If you go and, and look at the, uh, even on, on Amazon, this is, this is, obvious, but although uh, you can see it even more clearly if you go to something like Google Scholar um, and look at the amount of material that's been written by historians in particular about the Labour Party and compare that to the amount of material that's been written about the Conservative Party, the former vastly outweighs the latter, even now, although the, the balance has become a little more even. Um, <laughs> and so the people who were writing about Tory party history tended to be those people who were who had a kind of vested interest or were members of the Tory party or indeed uh, often were, were involved in government themselves. Uh, the narrative pattern that I explained at the beginning can be partly explained by a sort of competition within the party between economic liberals on the one hand and uh, more state centric Tories on the other. And they wanted to talk about their party's history in a way that fitted with their own doctrinal preferences. So, for instance, in the 1990s, there were histories published by Ian Gilmore, largely seen as, as, as quite far to the left of the Conservative Party. And Alan Clark, who was on the economic liberal uh, and then in inverted commas, right of the Tory party. Um, <laughs> they both published books in the 1990s and those bothly subscribed to that classic narrative that uh, I uh, just outlined and that narrative allows each tendency within the party to characterize the periods in which the opposing ideological strand of conservatism uh, uh, when that's in the ascendant they can characterize uh, those periods as ones of relative 
failure or mismanagement. To simplify, for, for Gilmore, this meant the 1950s good, the 1980s bad, and exactly the reverse in the case of um, Alan Clark. So it was another uh, more neutral historian of the party, John Charmley, has remarked, these explanations are really instruments in an ongoing contemporary struggle for the soul of the Tory party. And likewise, that conventional narrative, that description has been reinforced by the British left's extensive use of it as a kind of propaganda weapon. And that has been shown in the, particularly in the, the potent image of the hungry 1930s. I'll give you um, an example there. There we go. That's, these are um, posters from the 1945 uh, and 1950 uh, general election, um, contrasting what Labour has done with that image of the Hungary 1930s uh, and by implication that, that neglect uh, and that supposedly uncaring attitude on the part of the Tory dominated national government in the later 1930s. But of course, history written by interested parties is never entirely satisfactory. So it's up to us as historians to hold up such accounts to scrutiny and instead to convey some of the ambiguities and complexities that aren't captured by those overly clean explanations. Now, first off, the Tories were not nearly so obsessed with free markets and the minimal state in the 1930s as has sometimes been assumed. In fact, historians have increasingly acknowledged that the national government used extensive state intervention to try and alleviate the depression, whether it was successful is a different matter. Not only did it endeavour to keep money cheap, but it also created a large number of public corporations and marketing boards to stimulate industrial efficiency. And some historians, uh, such as Alan Booth, have even gone so far as to say that the government's encouragement of market concentration and restrictive practices, that is, things like mergers, cartels, imperial tariffs, resale price maintenance, monopoly and the such like, was a deliberate attempt to create a managed economy which would be better able to compete internationally whilst most importantly uh, protecting jobs at home as well. That the British economy responded very slowly to these measures was arguably more to do with its long-term structural defect than to so-called Tory neglect. So we should be differentiating between the, the Tory party rhetoric about the dangers of an intrusive state and how the party actually behaved when it was in office. The rhetoric is motivated principally by anti-socialism, and you can see some of that there. This is admittedly before the 1930s. Uh, it's a 1929 poster, but nonetheless, this is a fairly consistent um, language and symbolism that is used throughout the interwar years. Uh, the, for conservatives, socialism was a threat because of its supposed internationalist leanings, internationalist being a kind of a catch-all code word for, for various types of, of communism. Um, the conservatives aren't really that keen um, uh, then or now to differentiate uh, uh, particularly between different types of communism. Um, also a confiscatory fiscal po policy and above all uh, the practicalities of power. In other words, because Labour had replaced the Liberal Party as the main electoral threat to um, Tory parliamentary dominance. After World War I, with a supposedly volatile and poorly educated mass electorate in place, it was politically necessary for the Tories to portray the Labour Party as essentially unpatriotic, as you can see there, and as endangering civil liberties. Here's a, another example, uh, the supposed threat to English values uh, posed by socialism. Um, 
Secondly, although World War II is sometimes credited with bringing in huge political changes, my argument is that its impact on conservative policy was uh, probably mostly indirect. Certainly most conservatives had accepted the main wartime initiatives that ultimately made up the post-war social consensus, so-called, um, such as the Butler Education Act, the Beveridge Report, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, and the 1944 White Paper on Employment Policy. Generally, within the party, these were recognised as the as a kind of bounty, duly won by the working classes by their wartime efforts. But even here, we must add a caveat that demonstrates the party's ambiguous attitude towards the state. In the case of the Beveridge Report, for instance, Conservative MPs were initially deeply split over it. Churchill, in fact, only consented to its publication on the basis that although the report could be accepted in principle, no legislation could be put through whilst the war was being fought. That was a deliberate compromise to keep an argument in the, a lid on an argument within the, within the Tory party itself. So on the one hand, uh, for example, you have the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kingsley Wood, um, arguing that the implementation of the beverage scheme would Im involve intolerable rises in taxation and extension of state powers. And on the other, uh, when you have the, the report debated in the Commons in February 1943, 45 MPs from the newly formed Tory Reform Committee, uh, that's, uh, that's two of their leading lights, um, they're looking very, very um, modern there. <laughs> um, so there's, there's 45 MPs in that, in that uh, group uh, on the back benches and they were calling for the immediate creation of a ministry for social security uh, to begin work on the legislation that Beveridge's proposals would require. Uh, in fact, in the end, the only initiative from the report that becomes law prior to the war's end is the Family Allowances Act of early 1945. But the fact that there are divisions in Tory ranks uh, suggests that there would be further conflict over the state's role in the future. And the same, in fact, can be said about the White Paper on Employment that came out in May 1944. And that document took on an almost mythical status in the post-war world because it supposedly created a cross-party agreement that government responsibilities included the maintenance of full employment. Now, if that had really been the case, if that, if that myth were, had um, more truth in it than in fact it does, then we would expect those Tories in that la in the laissez-faire faction of the party to attack the 1944 white paper, but they didn't. And the reason for that was that it pledged nothing that Conservatives on the whole couldn't live with. The document promised only that government would try to sustain a high and stable level of employment rather than full employment and it would intervene in the economy mainly to stop it dipping into recession. In other words, it was a, 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 a counter-cyclical demand management that it, that it promised. Um, by all means, ask me questions about that at the end if you're unfamiliar with that term. And the paper did not envisage any clear micro planning machinery or any physical controls in order to fulfill that goal. In fact, the, I suppose you might call them parsimonious uh, economists at the Treasury, uh, people like Lionel Robbins, uh, had inserted loads of caveats into the white paper uh, to show that this high and stable employment goal was dependent on a lot of different factors and not simply a government's desire to intervene. Uh, moreover, the, uh, the paper required the institutions of industry, labour and finance, things like the TUC, 
and the FBI. I'd say the, the FBI is the Federation of British Industries, by the way, uh, not to be confused with its more famous counterpart across the pond. Um, it's what's now called the CBI. But the, that's the, one of the major institutions of, of, uh, of industry and uh, with the TUC and with um, uh, other uh, institutions of, of, of finance as well, like Bank of England, for example, um, the idea was that they should be, all be acting to, as far as possible, create conditions of full employment and at the same time um, not uh, overinflating the economy. Um, now, arguably their moderation that is argued for, that is urged in that white paper is, uh, um, is not truly exercised over the next 30 years, but that's kind of a, a different story. So in fact, what that white paper says, despite the myths around it, um, it's hardly surprising that most Tories, whether they're on the right or the left of the party, if, you, if those labels actually mean anything, uh, they didn't really bat an eyelid at the, at the proposals in the document. So it's only later when the Labour Party kind of skillfully repackages the 44 uh, white paper uh, and works on its sentiments or um, promulgates its sentiments in a different way uh, that you that you get a, a shift this is post-war from a commitment to what was a relatively modest aim to a vow to uphold full employment so the war's effect then is not that it pushes the tory party towards some form of collectivism but instead it's primarily because of its impact on the labor party that the conflict helps to shape conservative policy. But what the, what the Second World War does is to replace uh, essentially a, a kind of esoteric argument about the efficiency uh, the, and the, uh, the justice of socialism, or, or at least state control, with a concrete example. And the wartime extension of state powers demonstrated that economically, Central, co central control need not always be the disaster that the laissez-faire liberals had foretold. And that demonstration, that example, uh, is coupled with a determined attempt on the part of social commentators like J.B. Priestley, uh, and indeed uh, some people within the government itself, to promote post-war social reform, that by which I mean things like employment, better homes, healthier food, wider education, that sort of thing. And that leads to the more extreme strains of economic libertarianism, which are kind of floating around on the, on the, the right of, of the Conservative Party, um, being effectively completely marginalised from political debate throughout the, at least the, the second part, uh, the second half of the wartime period. So this cartoon by David Lowe, for example, um, shows how far such views have become ridiculous, even by 1942. Uh, and you can see there are various um, sort of rag bag of, of um, extreme individualists um, carrying banners such as lay down your lives for the profit motive, uh, fight for the liberty to be exploited and so forth. And the, um, the soldier um, is uh, questioning whether they've got the right war. Of course, Lowe was a socialist himself, so uh, of, naturally he's exaggerated those things for, for comic effect, but you, you get the impression there. So in short, the Second World War makes socialism marketable and the Labour Party electable. And that poses a grave problem for the Tories because, as I've said, their interwar election campaigns had played heavily on the threat posed to British life by socialism. Um, you may be aware already of Churchill's famous first election broadcast in the campaign, uh, and it's later widely judged to be a mistake. Um, it's, uh, there it is, um, or at least this is the, the salient part of it. Um, I, I, I'm not going to do the voice, um, 
largely because uh, it, it kind of hurts my throat, really. I must tell you that a socialist policy is abhorrent to British ideas on freedom. There is to be one state to which all are to be obedient in every act of their lives. This state, once in power, will prescribe for everyone where they are to work, what they are to work at, where they may go and what they may say, what views they are to hold, where their wives are to queue up for the state ration. That seems a bit odd, but uh, I suppose um, yeah, a, a reflection of the time. Um, and what education their children are to receive. A socialist state could not afford to suffer opposition. No socialist system can be established without a political police. They, by which he meant the Labour Party, of course, would have to fall back on some form of Gestapo, although no doubt humanely directed in the first instance, kind of a soft piece of uh, a, a little bromide at the end there. Now, church had probably uh, been influenced um, in the preparation of this speech by uh, Friedrich Hay von Hayek's recent book, The Road to Serfdom, which um, was a kind of a, a, a howl in the, in the wilderness at the time, but it, it saw state intervention as both uh, economically efficient and corrosive of civil liberty. Um, but in essence, that's of less uh, weight and less note than, than uh, what had happened. The, the dominant tropes, if you like, of the interwar years, so Churchill's broadcast, is really a relatively unsophisticated throwback to that rhetoric, to the rhetoric used against the Labour Party in the interwar years which we saw um, examples of with those with those posters um, from the from the interwar uh, elections. Uh, in this case, however, it, it seems it may have been a bl blunder. Indeed, Churchill's daughter suggested to him that he had completely misjudged the tenor of the times. And this is uh, her uh, letter to him um, after the the Gestapo speech. Socialism as practiced during the war did no one any harm and quite a lot of people good. The children of this country have never been quite so well fed and healthy. The rich did not die because their meat ration was no larger than the poor. And there is no doubt that this common sharing and feeling of sacrifice was one of the strongest bonds that unified us. So why, they say, cannot this common feeling of sacrifice be made to work as effectively in peace? Okay, now, of course, picking apart that, this does assume that what was practiced during the war was socialism, but nonetheless, this is this kind of criticism, um, all the more effective from coming uh, from uh, the prime minister's daughter, uh, is nonetheless important. The Gestapo speech, uh, as it came to be known, uh, is very easy to to ridicule. We, there's another cartoon here by uh, by David Lowe with as Churchill's uh, having his wrist slapped there. Um, life under the Atley terror, victim tortured for making a naughty speech. Um, and certainly the speech goes down in Tory party legend as a major reason for the size of the Conservative defeat. However, Evidence is actually quite mixed about the speech's impact. The left of the Tory party was mostly horrified at its harshness, but that may not necessarily have been the reaction of the public. So if we look at opinion poll evidence, we can see, let's have a look there. Uh, now this is from, from um, BIPO, that's the British Institute of Public Opinion. Uh, it's a relatively new polling organisation, um, which is uh, a set up uh, in the early 40s um, and models uh, what the Gallup organisation um, had been in the States. So, but, but public opinion and, and polling was, is very much in its infancy at uh, this particular point in time. Um, I mean, you might, you might say that it's, it's no, no better now, really, at predicting things. But um, 
this is kind of the, the best we've got for, a, for a, a kind of collective view of certain types of um, uh, public opinion uh, testing. Um, now you can see there that the that Labour leads the Tories um, for pretty much all of the war's later years from um, the middle of 43 to the general election of 45. And by early 1945, that February 45 figure there is, is pretty high. Um, but regardless, in, in early 45, the three polls that, that date from that period, um, February, April and May, uh, that's a, a lead that is that is 15% plus throughout that uh, early period of uh, 45. Um, but the fly in the ointment here is, and you can see where I put that, that arrow in, that um, immediately after Churchill's speech, the Labour Party's lead over the Conservatives drops back to something around uh, eight or nine percent. So there's difficulty in explaining this. If, if this is this speech has has been so um, has caused such consternation, um, but did it in fact uh, make a constructive contribution to the Conservative standing at this point? Um, or is there a problem with sources? Is it simply the public, opi the public opinion polling is so rudimentary that um, this uh, kind of snapshot is, is not at all helpful? Or uh, there's a third possibility, and which is the one I tend to lean towards, and that is that um, until early June, uh, Churchill had really not played very, very much part in the uh, election campaign um, and his speech is his first major foray if you like into the uh, into the, the campaign um, and so is it his simply that his his entry into the fray rather than what he said that causes the upsurge in support for the Tories obviously not enough to over, overturn the Labour Party's uh, lead there but nonetheless uh, it's one of those kind of murky moments about which it's impossible to be sure, but this is why, why you know, uh, this is why I'm, I'm in the business of, of history. I'm sure it's one of the reasons why you're all interested in history is because there are these kind of tangible, uh, intangible little mysteries that are, that, that are kind of locked away within the past. Um, what we can say about this is that the Gestapo speech um, indicated that old tactics, harking back to uh, an idea of of the Labour Party as essentially trying to impose something that was not far short of communism um, were not sufficient for the Tories to overtake a, a conspicuously moderate and modernising Labour Party. And uh, it also confirmed what had become apparent in parliamentary and party politics during the war and that is that the Conservatives were still confused about what the ideal role of the state should be, regardless of how they thought the Labour Party were conceptualising it. So Labour's unexpected new electability uh, surprised the Conservatives, uh, but the party's other major problem, and certainly at the 45 election, was the lack of substantial policy on its own grounds. Um, far more than the Labour Party, uh, the Conservatives had suspended internal, what you mean internal party, domestic policy making during the war. So their kind of unceremonious arrival in opposition at least gave them the opportunity to find some policies. And one of the first of those, one of the first of those to kind of um, break public consciousness to some extent, um, was the Industrial Charter of 1947, which was seen by many commentators, and indeed some within the party, as a major shift to the left. Here's how cartoonist Leslie Illingworth in the Daily Express uh, 
um, saw it. This is a deliberate, um, for those of you who know a little bit about 19th century um, British political history, you'll see that this is a, a, a deliberate harking back to the 1867 Reform Act uh, when the Tories were accused of stealing the Whigs clothes whilst they are bathing. Um, here you've got, uh, that's Rab, Rab Butler and uh, Anthony Eden who are uh, robbing the uh, the two leading lights, two of the leading lights in the Liberal Party, Clement Davis, its, it's leader, um, and Violet Bonham Carter of their principles and they're going to be carried off into the the open uh, bag being held by uh, Churchill behind the rock there, um, which is labelled New Tory Manifesto. Um, there's certainly a, a kind of a, a Liberal Party feel about the Industrial Charter because it has promises of a, um, a workers' charter. It suggests that government and industry need to work together to create a, uh, a national budget. Um, and it uh, accepts that um, a lot of uh, industries, such as the railways, um, can't be brought, can't be put into, into private handship and they should remain nationalised. Um, However, to see it uh, as a shift towards a more interventionist stance is, is to some extent a mistake. First, in spirit, the Charter is not very much different to what the national government was doing in the 1930s, uh, albeit perhaps relatively ineffectively. Um, and second, the Charter's authors also had to, because this is an official party document and it's, it's a kind of a policy paper that, that the, the party is, is wedded to, to some extent, the Charter's authors also had to appease the, the laissez-faire wing of the Conservatives. Uh, so the principle of ultimately reducing state expenditure in order to fund tax cuts was um, was also in the document uh, and, uh, and uh, a pledge to free industry from you know, one of these kind of vague catch-all phrases, unnecessary controls and restrictions. They're all going to go, those unnecessary controls and restrictions. Um, what, of course, uh, is deemed to be necessary and unnecessary is um, uh, yeah, kind of um, uh, left <laughs> conveniently open. Um, but it doesn't suggest that the Conservatives were now completely relaxed about more state control. Uh, rather, it reflects that ongoing tension, that ongoing argument within the party that I've already referred to about where the, to draw the line between the free market and the state. Um, the trouble with these initiatives that tried to bridge philosophical gaps within the apparatus of the Tory party is, well, uh, at the time, um, that the electorate was, was simply not listening to the Tories. Um, for example, in September 1947, the party commissioned the mass, or, or, uh, to, to apologise, uh, the mass observation organisation to run a survey on public reactions to the Industrial Charter. And these results were pretty miserably uh, disappointing, as you can see there, hopefully it's a little, little small, the, the text. Um, despite a considerable press coverage, only 20% of respondents knew what it was. And only one quarter of those, that 5% there in the yellow segment of the pie, um, could provide any detail on its content. And even when shown the document blind, so to speak, um, the workers' charter section of the document, most respondents uh, thought that it was left wing in origin. Um, and indeed, a majority of middle class voters believe that it was communist inspired. So uh, mass observation um, uh, said in its final report, it is difficult not to come to the conclusion that to most people, a conservative industrial policy is not yet in any way a living idea. So the problem there is, is um, policies are kind of falling flat for the Tories in the, the first two or three years after the end of the Second World War. Um, 
But if the consultant, uh, if, um, if the charter made no significant dent in public consciousness, what then did start to pull voters back towards the opposition? And that recovery is mainly stimulated um, by the government itself, the shortcomings of the government uh, and the Tory response to those shortcomings. So as Labour's austerity measures bit harder on the general public, the Tories began to develop a new propaganda message to counter the rhetoric of Labour about the, 19th, the hard 1930s and the, uh, the uncaring Tories in the 1930s. So one part of that new propaganda attack is the menace of economic controls, and that had been highlighted to some extent in the Industrial Charter. Uh, another was the accusation of economic mismanagement that became somewhat more persuasive after the failure of the East African groundnut scheme. Again, you can ask me a bit about that later if you'd like. Um, but it's the third Tory uh, line of attack that is perhaps the most important, and that is the extension of rationing in peacetime, and in particular the trimming of meat rations, which occurs uh, in the, um, the period between the 50 and the 51 uh, general elections. Um, I'll give you some examples there. Um, there's substantial public discontent about the, about the cost of living, about shortages and about rationing. And that's exploited ruthlessly in conservative campaigns. Um, if you, that's a variety of different figures from different polls. The, the difficulty of comp comparing across time here is because this, these are from Gallup. Um, and uh, the difficulty here is that uh, it doesn't ask the same question again and again and again. It, it asks different questions every time. Obviously, there's a certain amount of tweaking in, uh, in opinion polls to get you know, more accurate uh, data out of, out of the respondents. Um, but all of these polls give you uh, uh, an example that, that, these, that it, is, uh, it is rationing and the cost of living uh, separately or together that are kind of combining to create uh, a, a considerable problem for the the Labour Party. And this is um, that distress amongst certain parts of, of, of the populace, and particularly apparently women, um, is plays into a, a, a revised Tory party strategy for um, attacking their opponents. Um, and that characterization of the Labour Party as, as partly profligate, but, but mostly um, continuing these, these, these measures of austerity needlessly um, remains very powerful indeed throughout the 1950s. Um, and uh, particularly as uh, there's more stress placed on the consumer in inverted commas, which is a, a phenomenon that that starts to snowball during the 1950s into the 1960s. So the Tories then begin to develop a novel political discourse wherein the housewife, the consumer and the marketplace in a broad sense are combined into a coherent political strategy, at least in terms of uh, campaign uh, and, and literature and propaganda and that sort of thing. So uh, where does the Conservative Party stand by 1951? Um, 1951 obviously is the point at which they returned to power, albeit with a very, very slender majority. Um, now the answer to that is, as I've tried to show through what's essentially been a series of, of snapshots, is not particularly straightforward. Uh, one thing that historians need to do is to step outside their immediate more recent frame of historical reference, um, and that's for for, for everything that um, that we write about, really, uh, and that, that we research. In this case, we need to acknowledge that the party's rhetorical consistency about the the quote unquote rolling back of the state, if you like, um, is uh, really a consequence of the Thatcher years. Um, 
and in the 1940s and 50s, that type of language had yet to be adopted. And the majority of conservatives, at least in parliament, approached the issue far more pragmatically. But some things are clear. The first is that the standard narrative of the party being converted by the war to accept a benevolent intervening state is too simple. In fact, since the advent of mass politics and mass parties, and I'm really thinking of that as back in the, the, the last sort of third of the, um, of the 19th century, the party has always been in two minds about what the function of the state should be. And that continued right up until the, the Second World War and way beyond as well. So the war doesn't change that, but what it does is to create an electable alternative to the Conservative Party. And that in turn means the Conservatives had to create policies which would be seen as attractive by the electorate, which built on the welfare state principles that came out of the war, but at the same time did not completely alienate their more laissez-faire supporters. And that's why you get that kind of facing both ways in, in policy um, post-1945. Uh, and indeed, facing both ways, really, uh, in the 1930s as well, which is where we began. The other impact that the war had was to weaken that idea, weaken the, the propaganda value of that idea that the Labour Party is in favour of some kind of uh, socialist authoritarianism at the time. Uh, that requires a change of tactics and what the Tories do is to develop symbolism of their own to counter the Labour Party's very potent symbolism about the, the uncaring national government during the Depression. And the main thrust of that is that whilst the Labour government could not be uh, painted anymore as sinister and intrusive, it could be shown as economically incompetent for example, presiding over more rationing than had existed in wartime and denying people the, the the small luxuries that they should have been able to expect after the war. You can see some of that in the in the posters uh, that I have uh, put up on the screen there uh, from 50, the 51 election and the 55 election, just to, to show that this continues past uh, 1951. So in short, where the Conservatives changed, it's primarily because of the impact of the Labour government, not the war per se. Um, but in fact, the biggest change that it made were to alter its language and its image. And although this is probably the subject for another lecture, it is those alterations that substantially explain its return to power and its uh, re retention of power after 1951. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have returned to some form of normality. That's that's the that's the end of my chit chat. Um, but uh, if you would like to ask a question, you are more than welcome. Uh, probably this, you need to put your hand up or something like, like that. And I, I think there's a way of doing that on the the bottom line uh, of um, uh, of different menu items on, on Zoom. Um, and you can put your camera on as well if you like. That's me. I finished waving my, my arms about manically now. Or if you like, you can use the, the, the chat function to ask a question. Entirely up to you. Or you, or you can just go, uh, go off and make dinner. Alan, you've put your, uh, your hand up, you can Yes, thanks, Stuart. Um, you focused um, all through on economic policy, welfare policy. Um, of course, at the time of the 1945 election, the war was still going on. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, um, the empire was under threat and the um, um, so quick India movement um, was in, in, in swing despite the um, large participation of Indian troops in the war. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that then as now, um, 
foreign affairs didn't greatly concern the British public when it came to voting at election time. No, I think that that's absolutely uh, true. The um, foreign affairs always, uh, and I put again opinion poll data um, ragged in this in this period, uh, as I've already uh, mentioned, um, but it's pretty consistent that no matter what uh, terrifying sort of foreign policy mishaps may have may have happened um uh it, they almost never sway a, a general election and um so 45 is no real exception to that except for as you say that the fact that there's the war is continuing in the far east at that point um but that has much less impact on uh the way in which the, the electorate vote than the, the the simple kind of relief that the war is uh, is over and the the promise of a um uh, the a new kind of socialist well not socialist it's not it's not the right word but you know, social reform and 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 the such like so yeah sadly um yeah foreign policy never wins or even loses elections um uh, despite the fact that these are you know tremendously uh you know important in glo- in a global sense um it, it does appear that the british public doesn't really uh, respond at all uh, at election time to those types of concerns uh john um john james um Thank you very much. Enjoyed your lecture. Um, Thank you. Quite a quite a bit. There are two thoughts really that come out of it. First of all, to what extent do you think the huge defeat in 1945 played a role in either causing a rethink or just accelerating trends? After all, I suspect many Conservatives before that thought Churchill had won the war, great war leader, and was going to coast home to uh, victory. And <clears throat> it appears, and you may. Yeah, may know a more than me on this, but it was the overseas forces vote that actually, which didn't come in until a lot later, uh, that actually swung the balance and 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 sent him under. So, so that's my first question. And secondly, in parallel, I seem to remember that Lord Wharton was um, put in charge of the Conservative Party's organisation after the war, mm-hmm. and he tried to um, uh, push more of a mass membership and to change to some extent the composition. I have in the back of my mind that he told candidates or MPs they couldn't contribute more than fifty pounds. To their associations, yeah. forcing associations to uh, broaden their membership and, and whatever. So I, I just wonder those couple of points that just occurred to me. Any thoughts on those? Oh yes, uh, I mean certainly the uh, in terms of defeat, and I think that's got kind of tacit in some of the things that I was saying. Um, the, the 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 landslide defeat and the nature of it is is uh, far more important in kind of shifting the Tory party, or at least getting it getting it to talk about um policy uh than uh, the, the war itself um Tory party doesn't really like to talk very much about policy even at its upper levels to be honest um at least in this period uh so yes the the the, the defeat is 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 a, is a severe blow to the solar plexus um the in terms of uh changes to the organization of the policy yeah i think that's that's really important and something i, I didn't touch on uh, largely because it, it, it's a lecture in itself I guess um, and post 1945 there is a, a major push not only towards um, widening the, the base of membership um, but also um, there's more a, a attempt which is kind of vigorously resisted by a lot of constituency associations um, to centralize uh, the party um, and to, uh, to to get more information about who exactly is a member and who isn't because of course one is never a member uh, and until recently until the last sort of 20 years one is never a member of the central conservative party mm. one is only ever a member of the of the local conservative association um, and so there is there's a, a kind of a flurry of stuff that um, that comes out. I, I've been to the uh, Conservative Party archive uh, many a time, uh, and the volume of literature that comes out of of central office uh, that goes out to constituency associations um, increases quite dramatically um, after the forty five defeat. So yes, organisation is is crucial as well, and also a, a, a 
a more thoroughgoing attempt to create a social embeddedness, if there is such a thing, which I think it probably existed in the 19, uh, you know, uh, 1910s, 20s, to some extent 30s as well. No, I think it was John's question. He said about the, um, uh, the general election was still while the war was going on. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, but I don't know when the election actually was. But I was just thinking about the... Um, uh, the poll that you showed where um, after um, the Gestapo speech, the uh, lead of the Labour Party seemed to have gone down by July 1945. Yes. Um, the war is still going on in uh, just in in the east, in the um, uh, the, so the, the, the Pacific Rim. Because uh, I, I, I thought it ended in May. That's in in uh, in Europe. Europe in yeah. Europe, yeah. Um, so uh, so the, yeah, the the technically the war is still going on. There are still an awful lot of um, as uh, I think uh, John said. Uh, there are awful lot of, uh, of forces still stationed overseas, still fighting. Um, so that that, that vote, those votes are crucial. Um, uh, as to the what happens there when Churchill kind of intervenes in the uh, in the election campaign, and uh, I think uh, John was right to say that, that there was a, a sense in which the, well this this should just be a a case of just coasting along. Tory party, even the Labour Party, weren't paying great deal of attention to the to the opinion polls. Really, they were they were just a novelty. Um, uh, although they could really have, have told uh, both parties which way the wind was blowing. The, um, uh, that collapse in the Labour Party lead, it may be, you know, that the opinion polls were not, are not just not very sophisticated. But I suspect, and they, as, I, as I said uh, in the lecture uh, in passing, I, I suspect it's because Churchill simply hadn't been present, really. He hadn't really taken much part in the campaign nationally. Um, and suddenly he makes this, this kind of broadcast speech. So it may be something about a, a certain... Um, you know, he, Churchill's being kind of rewarded, if you like, but, but it's, it's still not enough. Um, by any means, to to over, uh, overturn when, the Labour Party's when, lead. When did the Labour Party actually take over from the Conservatives in that year? What July? What? Oh, it was in July. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you've got. So he's coming into that election campaign relatively late. Um, in he's he's that speech is in early june and that's right. really his first his first attempt to to um come into the camp you would think about election campaigns as much more um stately sedate and probably mm. more polite affairs than 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 they uh have been in the last kind of 20 or 30 years yeah. um so uh, that's that's not unusual for 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 national politicians to to kind of remain aloof to, to some extent from um, election campaigns, but uh, as I say, I don't think uh, obviously that that drop in in Labour support is is slightly alarming. Um, it's clearly not enough though for the uh, for the Tories to 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 uh, avoid what it turns out to be a landslide defeat. Mm. Um, but it may well have been that there was there is some kind of residual fondness for or, or residual um, respect or. Uh, gratitude towards towards Churchill um, that that produces that 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 change in in, in the opinion polls, but it's it's clearly you know, it's not enough per mm. se, and it clearly shows that 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 simply holding up the Labour Party as a as a bogeyman, which is going to um, intrude in every aspect of your life, is no not no longer going to no. to work. It only has a kind of a, it still has some effect, but it has a limit, far more limited effect than it did in the in the nineteen. Um, 20s, 30s. Yeah, very, very interesting, Stu. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Okay, I am going to, unless there are any other hands wildly coming up and flapping around, I'm, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll call it an evening. Oh, there's, oh, there's something in the chat. Hold on, there's something in the chat. I, I put a oh. question in the chat and then okay. I've just, as I've put the camera on, I said it. Okay, uh, lovely. Oh, Alan's asked a question. Um, 
Yes, well, no, you're right, Alan. Uh, the, the idea of um, about about landslides, what counts as a landslide? Um, this is, uh, I mean, it's kind of slightly off, off the topic of um, of my um, uh, uh, talk itself, but but uh, yeah, there are. I, I mean, even the the uh, the Johnson victory of uh, you know whenever that was just before just before the pandemic um, late 2019 we we're talking that uh, of that as a landslide but it wasn't um, necessarily a landslide in terms of the um, proportion of the vote uh, and likewise um, Labour Party didn't get a, a majority of the vote in 1945 so we tend to think of these things I I, I think at least uh, the way in which the press and the media talk about these things, it's largely seats um, so. Mm. Uh, and also, or perhaps also change. You know, if, if one party has did have a, a, a reasonably secure majority and then loses it quite dramatically um, to an opposition party, even though that opposition party might not have a you know enormous majority, I suppose that can be seen as a as a landslide too. And something like um, uh, the equivalent would be, let's think. Uh, the nearest I can get to that is is Heath mm -hmm. in 1970, where the Labour Party has a majority of um, in the 60s or 70s, a 60 or 70 seat majority, and then that's overturned, um, and Heath gets something like a 40 seat ish majority. Yeah. So that's in, in a way that's kind of landslide ish, although it wouldn't be referred to in the in the same way. It's just the way that the the press like to to um, <laughs> characterise mm. these things, but not always very accurate. Indeed. And thank you, Jill. Yes, indeed. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah the the war <laughs> the, the war dragged on for for a very long time after um, after the the European uh, theatre was was over and done with. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for for coming along. Um, you know, support your local LRAC. 